Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Welcome to another DXO webinar. I'm your host, Photo Joseph, and I am going to show you five, it's not the, the only five, it's just kind of a top five differences, advantages, cool things that you can do in DXO Photo Lab that are not in Lightroom. And it's, it's as a, you know, some things are kind of a, you like it this way better, but it's a personal preference and some are just flat out, mm, this is better. So that's kind of what we're going for here. I want to show you five things that are likely to get your attention, uh, significant differences between them. And of course, it's going to be the significant advantages of DxO Photo Lab. So with that said, we're going to start off with the initial raw processing. Now, as you probably understand, but just in case you don't, let me, let me um, elaborate on this. Every piece of software that reads raw photos has to do its own raw processing. You can call it processing, decoding, whatever you want to do. It is the process of taking the raw data, literal raw data, and turning that into an image. And the analogy that I always like to use is imagine a couple of chefs. You've got three chefs in the kitchen. You give them all the exact same ingredients, and you say, go make a chocolate chip cookie. They're all going to make different cookies, even though they're all going to be a chocolate chip cookie. Even though it's going to taste relatively the same, there's going to be differences. Some might use a little more or less of this ingredient. They might mix it differently, bake it a different time, whatever. They come out with a slightly different cookie, but they're all chocolate chip cookies. Same thing with raw processing. Whether you're talking about the raw processing from Apple, built into Mac operating system, back in the, built into Mac OS, the one from Adobe, Adobe Camera Raw, the one from DxO that's built into Photolab, or any other processor out there, they will all give you the same photo, but they're all going to look a little bit different. And how is different and what is makes one better versus another is very, very much subjective. Do you like this cookie better than the other one? Well, that's the way you feel about it. So it is very, very much subjective how those are processed. Some people prefer the raw processing from one company. Some people prefer it from another. Well, what DxO does is, of course, they have their own raw processing that is applied to the photos, but then they apply another layer of secret sauce to it. Okay, it's not really secret. We're going to see exactly what it is, but they apply another layer of of sauce, another layer of adjustments automatically to the image that are designed to, well, of course, make the image look even better. And so what we're gonna start off with is by looking at the images by default, a couple of different photos here, they're just by default, straight out of the camera, opened up into the individual apps so that you can see how one handles them over the other. And what you're going to see in here uh, for these photos in particular is how they look quite a bit different, quite a bit better inside of Photolab. So starting off with these pictures here. Now, these are, uh, this is the exact same file. You're seeing on the left, we have Lightroom. You can see it says Lightroom up at the top. On the right, this is Photolab. And I can't actually make this window any smaller, so it's going to kind of overlap like this, but you see both photos. And you should be able to see a pretty clear difference between the one on the left and the one on the right. The one on the right her face specifically is more illuminated. It's a little bit of a softer, um, not softer light, kind of a softer color, I guess we'd say on it. And overall, I think it just looks more pleasant. Now, this is a particular, this image is, uh, is a little bit challenging because it's backlit. And that's why I chose this photo because if you just take any old normal photo that's perfectly exposed, sun on the, on the surface, whatever, they're gonna look pretty, pretty similar, but you get into slightly more challenging photos and this is where you really start to see the advantages. So again, on the left, we have Lightroom, nothing done to it just to prove that. Let's go in here and I'll just click the reset, make sure that's reset. That is the way that comes out of the tin. We go over here to this one, the reset button is not available, telling me that it's already been reset. So this is the default procedure. Now, as I said, there's the raw processing, but then there's the extra layer of sauce that is applied to the image. And this can be controlled in the Photolab preferences. If I go up here to preferences, You'll see in here under the general tab, there is a preset, default presets for new raw images and then RGB images if you're bringing in TIFF files but uh, or JPEGs. But anyway, for raw images is what we're going to focus on. And by default, this is what it is set to when you first install it. It's set to DxO standard. Now, if you did not want the software to apply the default processing, you would go down here and you choose no correction. Or if you wanted to apply some other processing, you could do that too. You could choose any one of these and it would apply that by default. But most people are gonna want the DxO standard, but if you wanna be a little bit more of a purist about it, then you would set it to no correction. So with that done, what I can do is go into the presets and I can actually choose no correction. So let's, let's back up, if you will, and do that. I'll set it to no correction. And we'll see in here, the image actually looks quite a bit more similar. Uh, it's still, I think, the lighting on her face is a little bit better in this version. The colors are definitely more saturated than they were, 
but it is closer to what we had out of Lightroom. However, the default, if I, again, if I just hit the reset, we see quite a bit of changes happening in there that makes that a, a, a fair comparison. Now, you might be saying, well, hold on, I could just go over to Lightroom and hit the auto button, and that would effectively do the same thing, and that's there, there's some truth to that. It is effectively the same idea where if I hit the auto button inside of Lightroom, it will automatically apply its own level of secret sauce of changes to it. So let's let's give it a try. So go back over to Lightroom Classic, go to the settings and choose auto settings. And that was not good. It's, not, it's funny because when I did this earlier, it actually came out way better than this. That is that is not good. I'm like, what this? Let's just do this again. Because that is, uh, Lightroom performed better than that before. Let's try this again. We take this photo, photo. we're gonna go up here, we're gonna choose auto settings. No, anyway, that's it. That's all right. So I honestly, I didn't plan that. It was supposed to look better than that. Um, let me go to number two. Let's just compare the second image, and we should see basically the same kind of a thing. The one on the right's got a little bit more light on her face. It's a smoother light. Let's try the auto on Lightroom in here. Make sure that's reset. It's reset. Okay. And then let's see here. Let me close this. Where's that? There we go. Close that and go to settings and choose auto. Okay, that, that's a better, that's kind of what I was expecting to see. So with this auto one, it has illuminated her face much like the image on the right, much like the one out of Photolab. It has also brought up the saturation a bit, but look closely at her face. It's kind of, it's too saturated. It's a little bit too contrasty. It's almost like there's some extra texture going on in there that I don't really like. It is not, this is definitely not how I would be happy to leave my image. But on the right-hand side, the image with nothing done to it at all because it had the auto sauce applied to it, looks in my mind considerably better now there is a definitely a difference in the yellow the yellows are more saturated on the left and i kind of like that so i might want to compensate for that on the right i can open up my not the presets open up my uh, my effects go to the hsl tool for example and take the yellow and just bring up the saturation a little bit just just to bring up the saturation in the yellows on their own and at that point i'm definitely going to say the one on the right is a better looking image so Ironically, the first image that I hit the auto, uh, the, the automatic adjustments on in Lightroom definitely did not turn out that good. I swear I didn't plan it that way, but it was a good example of two different images, very, very similar images, and how differently they were treated for whatever reason and the ultimate end result on the right. So again, it comes down to A, your raw processing, which is extremely what that company does and very much subjective. And then on top of that, the auto adjustment that applies a whole bunch of different things to it. And if you want to look at what is being applied, let me, let's me let just reset this really quickly and go through here. If we scroll from the top to bottom, we see a, a white balance. It's uh, okay, it's set to edge shot, so that didn't change. Smart lighting is turned on, and this is a big part of what brings up the face on there. So you can see the slight difference in there in the smart lighting. Noise reduction is automatically applied. So if there's this image clearly shot in daylight, doesn't really need noise reduction, but if it needed it, then that would be getting applied right there. The cropping is kind of curious because the image also has a lens profile applied to it. We're going to talk about this in a little bit. There is a little bit of cropping that has to happen to the image because when the lens profile is applied, that image is going to be distorted slightly to correct for the natural distortion in the lens. And that would make the image no longer rectangular. So it's going to have to crop it a little bit. And that cropping is automatic, but you could actually turn that off if you wanted to or recrop it. There is smart lighting. I think we already covered smart lighting. Oh yeah, smart lighting we already talked about. Um, vignetting, de-vignetting, and we're gonna see this show up more as well later. You'll see it says de-vignetting was applied via auto with the DxO optics module. And the DxO optics module is another one of the big advantages, and we're gonna come to that. Uh, that is the third thing we're gonna talk about today. Uh, let's see, color rendering, anything applied in here? Default color rendering, um, lens sharpness, so the sharpness applied, chromatic aberration correction has been applied. All of those things are applied as the automatic process from the DxO standard. So again, different process. Ultimate goal is to get as usable or as close to a usable image straight out of the camera as you can without having to go in and mess around with the settings. And that's what we have we have achieved here. So that's number one. All right, number two, moving on to number two. Number two is denoising. This is about high ISO images. So let me open up this photo here and go to the Lightroom and do the same thing, denoise, here we go. And let's take this into the develop module and hide that. And we're gonna take both of these up to 100%. There we go. And I'm gonna not move the images for a moment, really make sure that there's time for the internet to do what it does and get you as clean of an image as possible. Now I understand 
you are looking at this through a webinar. So you are never going to see this as cleanly as I do on my screen, but hopefully it's different enough that you can see the differences in here. So this shot is, I believe, a 52,000 ISO image, super, super high ISO. And so clearly it's gonna be noisy, no matter what, right? Now, if you look at the noise pattern, both of these images are still noisy. This is, again, both default, no adjustments applied to the image other than cropping. I did a little cropping on it, but that's it. Look at the image on the left compared to the one on the right. There, there's actually a little bit of color difference. The one on the right has a little bit warmer tones, which I like. Um, again, that's probably subjective, but I like it better. But look at the noise pattern. And the noise on the left, I feel looks more like noise, whereas the one on the right to me is a bit more pleasing and has more of a grain versus a noise look to it. Quite subjective, but I think it looks better. I, looking at the two side by side, I think it looks better. Now that's, that's just opening the image. We haven't actually done the advanced noise reduction yet. Now, one of the huge things that DxO Photo Lab has is something called prime noise reduction. And prime noise reduction is such an intensive noise reduction algorithm that you cannot apply it in real time on screen. You can preview it in a tiny little window, and then it is actually applied on export. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to go back over to Photo Lab, bring up my control panel, and here is the noise reduction. And you'll see right now it's set to HQ for high quality fast, and that's just the default position. I'm going to turn on prime. And it'll take a moment, but you will see the preview in this little window here. And I can reposition that window if I want to, if I want to look at a different part of the scene. But I think her eye is a good place to get an example of this. And you can see what that's going to look like in there. So again, I'll leave it to uh, I'll, I'll not move the screen around for a moment, make sure that that comes through to you. If you compare now her eye inside of that prime window versus her eye in the main photo lab window versus her eye in the Lightroom window, you should see a pretty significant difference. But now let's see what it looks like if we apply it to the whole image. We actually render this out. So to do that, I will go down to export to disk and I'm going to export a 100% quality JPEG. This one will have uh, the appended .dxo or underscore DXO at the end of it. I'm gonna render this out and this will take a few moments to render. We can actually see a progress bar down here, but this is gonna take time because it's so intensive. In the meantime, I'll go over to Lightroom, select that image, hit Command Shift E, choose also 100% JPEG and just export that. And both of these images are now, have automatically been exported to the same folder as the original photo was. So now we can see them both. We'll use uh, Photo Lab to compare them. Since we're now gonna be looking at JPEGs, no additional processing is going to be applied. This is just gonna be the straight JPEG. And if we look at this and we do a comparison side by side, you can see a pretty dramatic difference. So there is the Lightroom one and there is the Photo Lab one. Let's try and get this just in the same position there. And you can see just how massively massively different that is. Now, if you feel like it's too much noise reduction, maybe it's getting a little bit too plasticky, if you will, you can certainly dial that down. You have in your noise reduction settings, if I go back to the raw photo, you can adjust the intensity of that, but um, but you can see here it's done an absolutely phenomenal job of doing that. So that's that's prime noise reduction, and that is number two in the sequence. We're gonna take a short break here. I'm gonna take a look over in the Q&A and see if there's anything popped up in here that I need to address and then we will jump right back in. In the meantime, please remember, if you do decide to make a purchase today, you can use this URL at the bottom, photojoseph.com slash DXO, and use this discount code, photojosephdxo15, to get yourself a 15% off. All righty, let's see here. Um, <laughs> Colin's saying there's no more webinars after this Thursday, nothing else scheduled. I don't know what is happening next, but there's nothing else scheduled. Um, cookies with sauce, yuck. <laughs> Okay, bad analogy. How about salt? A little bit of salt on that chocolate chip cookie. Do you like that? Here's the salt. Um, all right. Someone's saying, why use Lightroom? Um, that's that's up to you. <laughs> I'm just I'm here to show you the differences. And can we reopen a photo already processed in PhotoLab if you wish to tweak it using the DNG file type? When a new release comes out, you remove the old version. You also lose the collection of the old DXO. I'm quite confused, I'm sorry. When you, you're talking about when you upgrade, you're gonna lose your processing? No, the photo lab applies its processing into a sidecar file, a .dxo or something. Yeah, I think it's a .dxo sidecar file. Um, just like Photoshop or any Lightroom, any Adobe product creates the XML sidecar. Same thing, it's a sidecar file that has all of your settings in there and all those settings would be maintained as you move through versions. 
So I'm not. I'm sorry if I don't understand your question. But if your if your question is more technical than that, Richard, then please do reach out to DxO directly. Their tech support um, may be able to give you a, a better answer than I just did. Okay, let us move on. Let me move back into here, and let's continue. The next thing we're going to talk about is the optical corrections that get applied to the image when you first open them inside of PhotoLab. So this is part of that secret sauce or salt, since someone didn't like the sauce analogy on the cookies. Um, and uh, a big part of that is this custom profile. So let, let's take a look at what this means. I'm going to resize my windows here so we get back to the full size. There we go. So now we're looking at PhotoLab specifically. I'm going to go into the photo library and click on this next folder of images. And when I do this, we're going to get a little dialog that pops up that says, hey, yo, you need to download the current version of this particular camera profile. Now, this collection of photos is made up of pictures shot on a variety of cameras and lenses. Every camera and lens combination, get that right, every camera and lens combination has a unique profile that will be downloaded automatically by Photolab to be applied to your image as you load up an image with that lens and camera profile, uh, lens and camera combination. So in this case, what we're seeing here is there's a photo and it's it's this Mercedes-Benz photo up here. It says um, Olympus OMD EM5, so an older photo shot with a Leica uh, Sumalux 25 millimeter f1.4 lens. It's a raw file and it is missing the profile for this. So I just click on download and it downloads it and away we go. Now I've already let it download all the rest of them. I had deleted this one specifically so you can see the process. But the first time you look at a photo from any lens camera combination, that's what's going to happen. You get this little thing and it downloads it. And this is one of the unique things about Photo lab. Now, what it's doing is not what this profile is, is a correction profile designed to correct distortion, kind of native distortion that may be inherent to a lens, vignetting, chromatic aberration, sharpness. The idea is, and what happens over in the photo lab labs, uh, the DxO labs, is they profile all these camera and lens combinations. They have this big uh, chart and and calibration room and there's all this process that they do. They shoot a whole bunch of photos of very specific controlled things with this camera lens combination. And then they design their software to correct the distortion, to sharpen the edges, to lighten the edges that are vignetted, to sharpen the center, whatever it is that they determine is needed, that is built into this profile and that's what it gets applied to the photos. So let's take a look at some of these and we're gonna do a little before and after comparison. So up at the top uh, center here, there's a button that says compare. If I press and hold that, we'll see a comparison of the images. And some of these you'll see a more dramatic difference than others. Um, in this one, you can see there's a little bit of a bulging that's happening. So there's no corrections. And you see it says in the top right, no corrections. And there's the corrections enabled. Sometimes it's very subtle. Sometimes it's really dramatic. But that little correction is what's being applied. So let me, I'm going to run through a few photos and just do a before and after just so you can kind of see the differences in there. So this one's got quite a bit more of a distortion that's happening in there. So there's the original, which is funny because the original right now, you know, that's, that's fine, nothing wrong with that. But then you look at the corrective one, you go, oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, there's a bit of a, yep, definitely a bit of a change happening in there that was needed because now without it, you're going, it's not really straight, is it? So that's what happens in here. Uh, we're gonna come back to this center photo. I'll just go through a couple more of these. This one, you'll see a, a very large exposure adjustment. So here's no correction. The whole image, including especially the center part, um, is darker than you would expect it to be. But as I let it correct, it corrects for that. Um, this one here has a large amount of vignetting. So there's the original. Look at the edge, especially around the tire in here. You'll see, like right now, you can see the, the difference between the edge of the wheel, uh, the edge of the tire and the inside of the wheel well. And if I turn that off, turn off the correction, you lose most of that. What we're seeing in here is a very heavy vignetting by this lens that has been corrected in software. I mean, look just the overall around the edges of the photo, how much darker it is. Plus, there's that little bit of distortion that's happening in there. Cool. I mean, look at the wheel now. It's like the wheel looks like it's angled a little bit or something. Like, oh, I guess I wasn't straight onto the wheel. But then you turn on the correction, you go, oh, no, no, the camera was actually straight onto the wheel. There's just a little bit of lens distortion that has now been corrected in here. Um, last photo I'll show like this, same kind of thing. Watch the umbrella at the bottom. We're going to see a few things. You see a distortion happening around the edges, but look how much brighter that is getting, and that is all part of that lens profile. 
Okay, last one that I want to show you because this one I can compare over to Lightroom and you'll really see the difference in here. So right now, uh, the photo is clearly slightly at an angle. Um, I shot this a long time ago. This is in Singapore and I think I probably had the camera resting on a chair or something so I could do a long exposure, but I didn't have a tripod. So it's, it's at an angle, which is fine because I know I can fix that just with a straightening tool. But if I turn on or turn off the correction and I toggle this back and forth, look at the handrail on the bottom of the image, this handrail. It's, it's not perfectly level. We'll change it. We'll fix that. But look, right now it's a straight line. And if I turn off the, distor the correction, it gets a little bit of a curvature to it. Right? It's slight, but it's there. And once you've seen it, you can't unsee it. And if I go over to Lightroom now, let's go to Lightroom and get the same photos um here we go optical correction yeah optical correction bring up this photo zoom out okay there's that same picture and you can kind of see that curvature in there let me command tab back over to photo lab and the curvature is gone and i, I realize i can't make them exactly the same size so it's a little bit harder to compare but you can see that curvature is there in lightroom but here it has been corrected so that Profile is a really big deal of what gets applied and um, is a big part of the raw processing and a big part of the advantage of PhotoLab. Okay, I'm gonna do a little bit of quick correction on here just to kind of finish this image, if you will. So if I wanted to fix this, finish this out, I'd take my horizontal uh, horizon tool there, draw a line across it and straighten that out. Um, let's just apply that and maybe do a little, I don't know, a little, little curvature because I like a little bit of a little bit of curve, add a little contrast in there, and you go, yep, yeah, cool. All right, that's good. But now I want to do some more to it. I want to do some more. I want to enhance the sky. Maybe the oranges in the um, in the street are a little bit too intense. Or I don't know, let, let's play with them. And to play with them, I'm going to use the fourth advantage that I want to talk about, and that is U-Point technology. Now, for anybody who's not already familiar with this inside of PhotoLab, you may have seen this before in the Nick collection. The Nick collection has, the, and that's what used to be from a company called Nick Software, but is now owned by um, by DxO, the Nick collection, very well known, very famous filter set, has inside of it something called U Point technology, and it's kind of like you point at something and it fixes it. I think that's where that name came from. I could be making that up, um, but the idea is that instead of doing complex masking, you are dropping a control point on a particular color, and it's kind of a color and exposure value range combination where the software then builds a mask based off of that automatically. So let me let me show you exactly what this means. This is this technology, this U-point technology is now part of PhotoLab. So if I go into local adjustments here, I'll right click and I'm gonna choose new mask. And if you haven't seen masking in here, we've done a couple of webinars about masking specifically. So I encourage you to go back and watch those. Again, if you go to photojoseph.com slash DXO, you will actually be able to see uh, find all of those listed so you can just jump straight to it makes it nice and easy but anyway so in here I'm going to do a little bit of masking I've let's say I created a new mask I'm going to use the control point and I want to affect the blue sky so I drop that control point on the blue sky well right now nothing's happening because I haven't changed anything but before I make any changes let's take a look at the mask that has been automatically generated to do that, I click on show masks and we can see what is going to be affected by this. Even though this circle is really big here, it is going to affect the lighter areas is going to be affected more than the darker areas. That's how the mask works. And we're seeing that this blue part of the sky is going to be affected almost completely while the rest of the image for the most part is not going to be affected at all. And if I was to move this around, you would see like there I'm selecting just that kind of that darker cloud. Um, and it's kind of cool to do this in the in the mask view because you can really determine what part of the scene it is that you want to adjust. And again, this masking is all happening completely automatically. I don't have to, uh, I don't have to paint anything. There's no painting of it. There's no feathering changes. It's just an automatic creation of the mask based off of the color and the exposure values of the point that I dropped this on, of the point that I've pointed at, that you pointed at. So anyway, with that set. Now I can go in here and make some changes to it. So maybe I want to make it a little bit darker. So I'll pull the exposure down on that blue sky. And you can see how the exposure, if I go extreme, it's going to not look exactly realistic. But as I pull this down, you can really see how it's affecting the sky and not the rest of the image there. And specifically the sky, not just the clouds. And, you know, it's getting a little bit of the clouds as it kind of feathers into it. But all of that is just happening automatically in there with that mask created. So same thing on the, the orange on the road. So let's create a new mask 
and I'll drop a control point on the orange part of the road. And let's view that mask. And now we can see what is going to be affected. I'll make this really big to make sure I get the orange all around. So you can see it's just going to get those orange bits in there. Hide that mask. And maybe I want to make it a little bit brighter or a little bit darker in there. I can change the saturation of this. Let's go to saturation and make that a little bit more intensely orange. Or maybe I decided to really want to back that off a little bit, make it a little bit less. I can do that. Let's do one more. I'm going to add another control point onto the top of this building, the kind of roof of this building. And this is going to be a bit broader because so much of it is is very similar in color. So I'll take my my control point circle and make that a bit smaller and really make sure I'm just looking at the roof, or at least primarily just looking at the roof, find the best spot to mark that. That's pretty good in there. And what I want to do here is just cool it down a little bit. I'm going to pull the color temperature down on that roof just to make it feel even colder in the roof compared to the ground around it. So this is how control points work. Now, I've got a couple other images we'll play with a little bit. So again, we're now in the fourth section here. Um, let's go back to this photo here. This has this beautiful AMG red break over there, but it's a little bit dark. It's a little bit hidden, a little bit hard to see in there. All right, easy enough. Local adjustments, right click, make sure we got a new mask on here. I'll drop one on that red break in there. Let's make this a little bit smaller and show the mask. Make sure we're just getting that mask in there. Looking pretty good. Now you'll see in here that it is catching a little bit of the wheel around it. We're going to come back and clean that up. But let me turn off the masks and we'll just brighten this up a little bit. Let's take the exposure of that brake pad up a little bit. Um, maybe I'll bring up the saturation a little bit like so. Yeah, looking pretty good. Um, but if you feel like it's that spill that's onto the rims there, you don't really want. What I can actually do is protect part of the scene the same way. So this is a control point that's been added to the brake. We can see it's very clearly grabbing the brake primarily, but we are getting a little bit of spill. So I'm going to go down here to negative control points and I'm going to start protecting areas. I click on that and it protects that part of the rim. You see how the rim just went totally dark on there. Uh, maybe inside of the logo in there, let's protect that as well. And now we've got a cleaner mask and I think that's pretty good in there. And again, we can see that difference. And if I adjust the exposure on that, you can see how we're really just affecting that red break in there. So just, just really a fantastic, fantastic way to work. Um, one more photo. Let's do this one next. Go to this photo. Basically, same idea. I want to enhance the red umbrella in the front. Clearly a very, uh, very central part of this image here. So I've got my local adjustments. Go to a new mask, and I'm going to just drop one right on the red umbrella in there. Let's show the masks. And here you can see how the different shades of the umbrella mean that I'm not getting the entire umbrella yet. So maybe what I do now is I add additional control points onto other parts of the umbrella. And we don't want to get too carried away here outside of the umbrella itself. I think I controlled the wrong one there. There we go. Let's make that a little bit bigger. Um, we don't want to get too carried away in here, but we do want to grab other parts of that umbrella to effect. So I've combined these masks together. And now as I turn that off and go in and take the exposure up a little bit, uh, you can see how that is affecting that. Maybe I'll do set a little bit of contrast in there as well. Maybe pop up the colors a little bit too. And now we've got that really dramatic enhancement to that umbrella without having to go in and do any manual masking. And it did spill a little bit into the crowd in here, which in this case worked out fine. If it didn't, I could go in with negative control points and start protecting it. But I think that worked out great. And so now we have this very dramatic kind of popping of that red umbrella against the otherwise very dark gray background. And of course, if you want to, you can also go in and do things like add a linear graduated filter on here. Let's do that into the sky take the exposure of the sky down a little bit, maybe pull the shadows really far down, really darken that up, make it a little bit a little bit more dramatic in there. Um, let's spread that feathering out. Oops, spread that feathering out a little bit better. Find that happy place on there. Close that out. Looking pretty good. Looking pretty good. So again, we'll do a compare before and after. Pretty dramatic. So those control points, those U points are an absolutely huge part of what is um, what is different in there. All right, now we're going to go to number five. And this one is not a demo, but it's simply showing you the web page. This is the pricing and the purchasing plan. So with Photolab, it is a one time purchase. As a dot release is released, there's no additional cost, of course, standard software model. When a major revision comes, then you can pay an upgrade price if that's what you, if you decide to do that. If you decide not to pay the upgrade price, that's fine. You can continue using that version of the software forever and ever. Of course, as everybody knows, Adobe now has a subscription model, which is at minimum $10 a month, and it goes up 
from there. So $10 a month at minimum forever and ever to have access to photo uh, to Lightroom Classic or um, over on the photo lab side, you of course have the one time buy it now and you've got it forever. So pretty significant difference. And it's just one of those things that for a lot of people, the subscription model is not something that makes them happy. And so you have this option. Um, you have the ability to just buy it outright within photo lab so that's everything that i wanted to show you i'm going to jump back over to the questions and see if there's any questions that i can answer in here and um and yeah that's what we're going to do next okay um sandy says why didn't i do noise reduction in lightroom lightroom has its noise reduction automatically applied you can go in there and apply additional noise reduction but the prime noise reduction is absolutely standalone just phenomenal if you want we can we can do because that's that's a totally fair question. Why didn't we do extra noise reduction there? Let me resize my windows and bring these back. I just don't really have to do that. I'll, well, no, we'll do it. Um, oh, that was the Lightroom window. Wrong one. Let's put that over here and make the photo lab one smaller. And let's go into the photo library denoise and pull this one up denoise okay so there's that picture so now i guess what i really need to do is not so much do that comparison but go into develop and look, there we go into develop and noise 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 so add some noise reduction to this so let's start bringing this up and if we go let's bring it up pretty high i'm going to try and get it to what I would consider the level that we had here. Let's look at this exported image, 100% on there. Yeah. There we go. Okay, that's a, that's a good side by side. So now, as I start to bring the noise, yeah, we're well, I'm way beyond I think even what was applied earlier, and we're seeing the highlights are getting blown out in ways that weren't before. If I get it up too high, then it goes full plastic. Definitely have some highlight protection that would need to happen. And there, although to be fair, we blew highlights out a little bit on there as well. Yeah, you know, it just takes quite a bit more fiddling. And I don't know. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I think the idea being you get you get this prime reduction. It's just one click off you go and export. But it's a fair question. Fair question. Absolutely. Thank you for uh, for forcing me to do that. <laughs> um, all right. Let's see here. The, oh, somebody's asking about the denoised version. If we so there's denoising that happens at the raw level. It's a, I don't think there's a way to compare truly no noise applied. Um, in Lightroom, I don't think you, there's any way to turn it off completely because this, even with noise reduction set to zero, which is the default, is not the true raw image. You actually can see that in PhotoLab. Not that you would ever want to do that, but um, let's see here. Where is, if I turn off noise entirely, oops, I uh, went to the wrong way. There, right, where'd it go? Turn off noise entirely. Vignetting tone curve, there it is. Okay, if I turn, oh, I'm looking at the JPEG. I have to go to the raw image and turn off noise entirely. There you see more what is natively coming off the sensor and you see a lot of colored noise. Um, that is, it's the same file, so obviously it's there in both, but Lightroom kind of hides that level of noise reduction. Again, it doesn't matter. I would never not have this on because you can see here, it's just so much noise that's happening, but that is standard. Most software raw decodes, you're going to see something that looks more like oops, my more like this to start, put it back to its default. Um, that's more like what you're going to see to start because there is noise reduction being applied to it. So hopefully that helps in there. Uh, someone asked, can you use DXO with Photoshop jump between the two programs? Yes, absolutely. There is, uh, well, since I'm at least in Photoshop, not Lightroom. So, okay, from Lightroom, there's actually a plugin to send an image to PhotoLab and then bring it back again. So you can do that if you want to. Um, for Photoshop, because Photoshop, you're just opening a file from the Finder. Right here, what I'm looking at, if I look at the photo library in here, this is just my Finder, right? We're looking at a Finder view in here. So if I right click on one of these images and I say, and I say, um, reveal oh here we go reveal image in finder you'll see it's just my folder in the finder with all of these um, images in it 
So I could from Photoshop just go in and open that. So absolutely, you could use both, no problem whatsoever. Uh, someone asked, does DxO noise reduction use the same algorithms as Nick? No, no, the noise reduction that is prime noise reduction is totally different than the Nick ones. The Nick ones are actually quite old at this point. They really haven't been updated um, because the noise reduction that's in uh, in Photolab, prime noise reduction is quite a bit better. So yeah, so there's that. Um, let's see here. Anybody else? Someone's talking about another webinar on Thursday about print. That one's not mine, but awesome. Yeah, there are webinars being done by other folks. Um, is there any way to get a PhotoLab 3 to add a watermark? I think not. No, Mike, there's no watermark on Expert, unfortunately, out of PhotoLab. Uh, Norm is saying denoise applied only at the end of the process. For the, um, for the prime noise reduction, that is correct. It is only applied at the end. Other people talking about the print show on Thursday, and I'm, I know I'm not getting to everybody's questions. There's a ton of stuff flying by in here, and a lot of it's just um, chatter, so I'm trying to filter through these and find the right ones. Um, uh, Frank says that Capture One has recently launched a dedicated program for Nikon cameras. That's, an, that's odd. I haven't seen that. DxO is one for all types, same quality. So DxO is one app for all camera types, but remember every camera and lens combination has that unique profile, which is one of the big standout features, which is something that completely separates it from, um, from other, other software out there. Uh, can you download all the profiles ahead of time? You cannot, I don't think so. Let's see here. You have, if you go to your GXO photo modules, you can manage, or oh, maybe you can actually. Yeah, uh, wait here, show. Yes, here you go. That would be tedious. I don't think there's a one button to do it, but if you know, okay, I've got a, I don't know, let's say you've got a Canon 5D Mark IV. There we go. I got a 5D Mark IV and I look through, I go, oh, I got that 16 to 35, I'll download that. Oh, I got the 2470 F4, I'll download that. Oh, I got the 40 F28, I'll download that. So there you go. So yes, you can download them individually that way. You can't just one click download all of them, but that would be a lot because there's thousands of these. So this is how you do it. You just go through and look for your camera and lens combinations that you yourself own. Um, all right, let's see here. How do you recognize Tokyo Big Sight, Emma Bill? That's, uh, that's exactly what that is. That's a long time ago I shot that picture. Um, need to explain the workflow of using Lightroom with DxO, how to install the DxO plugin. The DxO plugin gets installed automatically, but then when you're in Lightroom Classic and you want to send it to PhotoLab, you go to Plugin Extras, transfer to PhotoLab 3. You see I still have PhotoLab 2 in here as well. Transfer to PhotoLab 3, that's it. That's all there is to it. And then once you're in PhotoLab, there will be a button that says send back to Lightroom. That's all. And this gets plugged, this, this gets installed automatically for you. All right, we're gonna do a couple more questions and then we are going to be wrap this up for the day. Um, someone's saying the vignette correction of the car adds fill light to the tire wheel well. Since when does optical vignetting occur in the middle of the frame? It's not about vignetting, it's, a, it's just an exposure correction, exposure compensation that is happening throughout the image. The vignetting is obviously the darker edges, not the center of the frame. Uh, let's see here. I had a question regarding noise reduction. You mentioned in another webinar, which boiled down to that I should keep the standard noise reduction on. Where did you mean? Oh, that's what I was just showing in here. You wouldn't turn that off in, in, let's go to customize. You would not turn this off because the results are pretty abysmal. Let's go back to the raw image. If I turn off noise reduction, this is what you get, which is obviously awful. So you wouldn't want to do that. Um, PhotoLab 2 does not support images taken with an older camera, but Lightroom does. That's something you would have to reach out to DxO about. They have done literally thousands of lens and camera and lens profile combinations. Uh, if, if yours is missing, that's something to ask them about. Uh, I would say odds are though, if it's a really older file, it's probably not gonna get added to it, unfortunately. A uh, really older camera. All right, a couple more in here. I'm just gonna kind of grab some at random. Does the control mask only affect what is inside of the circle? So talking about the uh, the control points. I call, I ref, this is not the official name of that circle, but I refer to it as a circle of influence. Basically it is large, is mostly what's in there, 
but there is a very gradual soft fall off. So it is not a hard line edge and you can't adjust how far in or out of that edge you go. You simply adjust the whole circle size and watch the mask to see what does or doesn't get affected. So stuff outside of that circle can get affected, but the primary area of influence is what's inside of the circle. Alrighty, um, one more, one more, one more. Let's see, there's a lot of, okay, we'll do two more because I do need to wrap this. Oh, I guess I got four minutes and then I have to wrap this one up, unfortunately. Um, no introduction, DxO is clearly better than Lightroom. Thank you. Um, are all NIC collection effects included in DxO Photo Lab? No, the NIC collection is a separate purchase. It is not included in Photo Lab. Control points, killer feature, I concur. What about keywording in PhotoLab 3? Keywording's in here. You have it. It's right here, right here on screen. There's your keywords. Um, my video card is 512 megs. Will it work with that? I have absolutely no idea. You can probably look up the minimum spec requirements on the DxO webpage, um, and it's going to have to do with more than just your graphics card. Um, are the NIC collection effects included again? No, NIC collection is not included. That is a separate effect. Can you download camera files directly into Photo Lab? We covered that. Can you make a panorama in DxO? It does not have a built-in panorama feature. That's a pretty nice feature. It does not have that, I'm sorry. Uh, is there a list of all the cameras and lenses supported? Yes, if you go into the DxO modules, here is a DxO op optics modules roadmap. I think this also takes you to a page that shows all of them. So here, yeah, you can search um, individual cameras, you can search, let's say you've got, uh, let's do for type Canon 5D. There we go. We go Canon 5D3. Let's say that's your camera. View lens modules. And there we go. And so now we're seeing Canon 5D and lens modules. Those are all the ones that are created. So that's how that works. It's actually kind of a cool website. Um, do, 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 do. Where you... When you send an image to PhotoLab from Lightroom, okay, does Lightroom auto-process the raw file or is it sent through untouched? I think you have a choice, although I don't remember. Let's find out. Okay, let's do, let's do a different picture than this one. This is going to be the last question, then we're going to wrap it up from here. Um, let's go to where I have more photos here. Let's say I want to take Big Sight from Tokyo and send that off. So I go to the file menu. Is it nothing? Oh, here, let's, let's really like make this obvious, we'll go into develop and um, what do I wanna do? I don't use Lightroom Classic anymore. I don't remember how this works. <laughs> I was gonna make it black, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, we'll just leave it like that. Okay, whatever, color, color image, original photo. We're going to go into plugin extras, transfer to Photo Lab 3. Let's see what it brings over. It brings over the raw, right? So there you go. So the .cr choose the raw file, that's right. So that's what it's doing, it's sending the raw file over. So now let's say I do something here Let's do something really dramatic. Um, do big curves thing. Let's say, I know that looks terrible, but let's just pretend. And then I would hear from here, share, I'd say export to Lightroom. And what do I want to send it back as? I, obviously I have to process it. So I want to send it as a TIFF DNG or JPEG. Um, so we'll let's just say, say TIFF, why not? We'll do a TIFF and we'll do a 16-bit TIFF because we want everything in there. Export, it renders that out. You see a render progress bar down here at the bottom. And then once that's done, it switches back to Lightroom Classic for me, which imports it automatically, and there is the imported image. And if we look at the albums, let's see here, there's an import history, so there it shows. You also see it gets added to a collection with today's date on it. Let's see if I make this bigger. With today's date and time on it, so you know when that was that it came over. Um, and I think, let's see here, I think if I look at the library, go back to, where was that image? That was here, there we go. And now it's also, it sent it back to that same folder. It has re-imported it back into that same folder inside of, um, in the finder, so showing up in Lightroom as well. All right, guys, that is it. I'm gonna wrap it up there for, uh, for the day. Thanks so much for tuning in today. I do greatly appreciate it. Hopefully that was entertaining and fun for you. 